We are in Mark chapter 12, and uh, this this is an interesting um, story that a lot of people are familiar with, I think. Um, this is the story of the widow who throws the penny, or the widow's mite, or the lepticon, into the offering funnel. So if the way to think about this is to think about the fact that in the in the temple um, in Jerusalem they had metal funnels. And what would happen is people would walk by the metal funnel, which had of course a hole in the bottom, it would drop money into into a container. And people would walk by, and, and if they were rich, they would take a big, heavy, you know, metal coins, and they would drop them in, right? Clatter, 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 and everybody's, ooh, you know. Um, and then the widow comes in, and she drops in a very small coin known as a lepton, and it is your, your, your object lesson for today. This is a lep, the coin she dropped in. Huh? So I'm going to pass it around. You can get it back to me. It's from first century, so don't lose it. Um, but that is that is the coin that the widow dropped in. It didn't make much noise, and that was part of the point of the story. So let us listen to the story of the widow's mite. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Clank, clank. Many rich people put in large sums, but a poor widow came and put in two small coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. What God do we believe in? We have options, you know. If you listen to people talk, if you read the news, or worse yet, immerse yourself in social media, it will seem as if people believe in different gods, even if they are supposedly part of the same faith system, even if they call God by the same name, Yahweh, or the King James Version of that Hebrew word, Jehovah. Even though they all say they follow this guy named Jesus, if you listen to them, talk about their faith, if you explore their values, look at their priorities, watch their actions, it seems as if they pretty much believe in different gods. For some people, God seems a little cranky, a little demanding, sometimes maybe even a little cruel. One God seems to make deals with the rich and powerful and seems to have no interest at all in the poor and the weak. One God, one people's God seems to side with one group and, or one nation and not be interested at all in anyone else. Some people's God seems to be just fine with the use of power against people. One God seems to be more than ready to punish people through illness or natural disaster or eternal retribution. But then some people have a God who seems to be very different than that. A God who, for the lack of a better word, is love. A God who is the embodiment of generosity and compassion and fairness. 
a God who is with people in their suffering rather than a God who causes people suffering. A God who asks that we welcome the stranger. A God who asks that we take in the homeless and clothe the naked and feed the hungry. A God who gives and forgives and forgives and gives and pours love into people and pulls love out of people. It's almost as if there are different gods. Okay, perhaps not different gods, but very different ways of thinking about God. Different ways of framing God. And how one thinks about God, how one frames God, makes a difference. It matters. In terms of how we live and how we see the world. And that's kind of what we see in today's passage. Today we see the difference it makes. This, this concept we have of God. So in today's story, we have two, two groups of people, or maybe a group of people and a person, who seem to have very different understandings of God, very different ways in which they understand God. And how these two groups understand God impacts profoundly the way that they function. One group, one understanding of God, is represented by those whom Mark calls the scribes. Now the scribes were a group of Jewish leaders who flourished uh, from really from the return of the people of Israel from, from the, uh, the time when they were in exile all the way through the time of Jesus until the temple was destroyed in AD, in AD 70. So this group originally was a group who basically copied manuscripts, right? They were literally scribes. They copied royal manuscripts. They copied sacred manuscripts. Later, this group became literally, um, this name indicated an office. It was almost like an official office, a post. And, or it was a designation, maybe a little bit like reverend. So these people were people who were noted for knowing the law of Moses. And they lined up with the chief priests who were the Levites, the Sadducees who were the rich nobility, and the Pharisees who were the, the legal walks of, of the Jewish world. They lined up with that group and they together, all of them together, formed the Jewish aristocracy. They were the upper crust, the upper class of Israel. And many of this group, the scribes in particular, were members of the Sanhedrin. And if you don't know what the Sanhedrin was, <coughs> think Supreme Court. They were kind of the religious Supreme Court of Judaism. Now, before we get off track from the very beginning, I want to make it really clear that these were very religious people. And I want to make it really clear that these, for the most part, were very good people. These are not bad people, okay? They're good people. These are people who have lived and breathed the scriptures their whole life. They've copied the scriptures, they've studied the scriptures, they've taught the scriptures, they have taught from the scriptures. They have lived according to the scriptures, or at least their understanding of the scriptures. These people know the words of God and the words about God very, very, very well. But the problem was, and it's a problem that was only revealed when they kept running into Jesus, the problem was they didn't appear to know God very well, the nature of God very well. What they believed, this group of people, was that God was demanding and exacting. What they believed is that God was punishing. What they believed is that if you didn't follow God's law, and you didn't follow God's demands, if you weren't obedient, if you didn't do everything just right, you paid for it. Of course, they also believed that if you did do the right things, if you followed the law, you were rewarded for it. So basically, this was a group who said, obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. It was kind of as simple and as complex as that. But here's the thing. 
they had a merit-based system, right? You earned your position, your favor with God. You earned it or you didn't. You were in God's favor because you did the right things and you followed the rules, or you weren't in God's favor because you didn't, and thus you were blessed or cursed, depending upon your behavior. So for them, faith was really simply about obeying the law. Obey the law so well that God is obligated to bless you. So they spent a lot of time focused on the law, right? Learning the law, defining the law, explaining the law, interpreting what it meant to follow the law. These are the guys, and they were guys, who created the books of the law whose sole purpose was to ensure that one followed the core laws, the Ten Commandments. So in the Bible, we have the Ten Commandments, and then we have what is called the Tarak Mitzvot, which is another 613 laws that are found in the Torah that are meant to explain what it means to follow the Ten Commandments. And then on top of that, we have the Mishnah, which was created by these folks, which were another thousand-some laws that were put together to explain how to keep the 613 laws that you were going to use to follow the 10 laws. Got that? <laughs> so life was focused around an effort to convince God that you were worthy. But what often happened is they not only spent a lot of time trying to convince God, they spent a lot of time trying to convince everybody else of their worthiness and their holiness and their righteousness. So we're given a picture here of the scribes in Mark, right? And we find them first, this is the opening definition, we find them first strutting around in robes. So these were ceremonial robes. I can't help but think of like, you know, minister robes, right? So these were the guys in black, except that it probably wasn't black. This was their way of proclaiming their righteousness, right? I'm wearing this garb, and I'm going. that proves to you, right, that I know the law, that I'm following the law, that I'm kind of a special guy. The whole purpose of that was so that people would look at them, basically, and say, oh, wow, there's one of the holy guys. So they dress up. They strut around, but we're told more, right? We're also told they seek places of honor. Places of honor in worship, places of honor at banquets. We're also told they, they pray really long prayers. These guys are sounding more and more like ministers, aren't they? <laughs> really, really long prayers. And we're also told that they literally throw money at God. Right? They're throwing those big hunks of money into the offering funnel at the temple, making a big noise, right? <coughs> throwing that money in there so the money and the coins are rattling down and telling everybody, oh, what a generous person this is. Wow, aren't they cool? But think about this. What's the motivator here, right? The motivator is the belief they have to earn their acceptance by God. And there is a belief here, right, to some degree, that they have earned acceptance by God. And we're in pecking order territory here. I've earned my acceptance with God. I'm pretty darn holy. What about you? Oh, you? Not so much. And so there was a lot of judgmentalism that came in here, a lot of arrogance that came in here. Jesus is constantly pecking at this, right, when he talks with this group. I remember a time many years ago when I was watching a junior high track meet. And my son was participating, and it was the it was the guy the boys' mile, and everybody's grouped together, right? Standing along the track, that last 100 100 yards, they come around the corner, um, and they're up and down that that last 100 meters. The crowd starts to cheer, right, waiting for somebody to break from the pack and win. 
and there's this group of boys just men they're just going for it and they're all tight bunched and everybody's excited and then I happen to look back and they're like way back hopelessly back hopelessly last was this kid who obviously was not having a good time with this mile run his entire body was wobbling. He was done, right? I mean, he he was totally done. His face was bright red. He, he was he was definitely in pain, and he was just kind of weaving down the track, right? And you knew he was finished. He had given it all he had, and it wasn't enough. And he was going to come in last. That was just the way it was going to be. And then all of a sudden, actually, out onto the track runs a, a woman. Obviously, this guy's mom, right? And she looks at him and she yells at him at the top of her voice and she goes Johnny run faster <laughs> and I will never forget that moment and the look on that kid's face right he had to be thinking run faster what am I an idiot right do you think that the problem is here that I just forgot to run faster that I'm not trying I'm running as fast as I can well, these people were kind of people who seemed to have a God who's kind of like that mom, right? Be better. Have more faith. Be more obedient. Be holier. That was the whole framework that these poor folks were working from. Well, you know, when you live out your faith in that framework, when you're trying to please this demanding God, you end up in some kind of nasty places. Number one, you feel like crap because you can't do it, right? If you're like that kid. You come around the last corner, everybody else is 50 meters ahead of you. Not fun. But the other problem is you're trying to prove yourself to yourself. You're trying to prove yourself to other people. And you're measuring yourself constantly. And you're measuring everybody else constantly. And so we get all of this effort and all of this judgmentalism and all of this stuff going on. And it's just not a pretty place to be. These poor people are living by the book. They're following the rules as best they understand them. They even give according to the book. I'll bet you every single one of these folks gave a tithe. A 10% tithe. I'll bet they did. But they're functioning out of a need to be okay with God. They're functioning out of a fear that they're not quite good enough. They're functioning out of a fear of being insignificant or a fear of being poor or a fear of being rejected by the holy. And the problem is that in all that effort and all that fear, there's something missing. There's lots of rules, but there's not much grace. There's lots of obedience, but there's not much heart. There's a lot of righteousness, but it's self-righteousness. And out of all that, we get this rigidity and this judgmentalism and this coldness. And the symbol of the coldness, as it comes out of this passage, the sign of this coldness is this. The fact that they devour widows' houses. Now think about that. Here are these super ultra-righteous people, and we're told that these guys are devouring widows' houses. In other words, they're, they're slumlords. They're buying houses out from underneath poor people. They're not nice people in terms of ethics and morals and how they treat the people around them. They're trying to follow the letter of the law, but they end up treating the poor and the vulnerable with disdain, right? Now, it would be easy to take this story and say, okay, now let's look at all the people that we think right now are kind of like that. But that's not what this story is about. And in fact, we can't use stories like this that way. You know why? Because these stories are not about them. These stories are about us, right? So this story is asking us not to look at other people, but it's asking us to put up a mirror in front of ourselves and say, OK, am I like that? And in what ways am I like that? To what degree am I like the people in this passage who are being used as an example of what not to be? Does the God I have created take me to places where I end up judgmental? Does the God I have created make me angry and hateful? Does the God that I have created make me a person who gets caught up in appearances? 
do I get overly focused on the rules? Do I get arrogant? Do I have moments when I'm not compassionate or generous, when I'm judging and rejecting, right? Are there moments when I'm like one of these guys who is stealing homes from widows? Speaking of widows, there's a widow in this story. This woman who throws this little teeny measly lepton into the funnel. Bing! She, she's nothing, right? I mean, she really is nothing. Widows had no social standing at all in Israel. They were, they were nothing. She knows she's nothing. She knows she's poor. She knows she's powerless. She knows she's vulnerable. She knows that she's one of the least of these. But isn't it interesting that it's from her that we get, according to Jesus, wild generosity. Where does that come from? Where does that come from, that ability to throw that last coin into the bin, that coin that she needed to live on? Why does she do that? Obviously not to impress, right? Bing! Honestly, I don't know why she gave that way. But I do know that she did. I do know that she did. And I know that she did it quietly, kind of under the radar, right? Which suggests to me that it wasn't about earning merit. That it was not about trying to make a show that it wasn't about trying to earn anything, it, that it probably was about expressing thanks, or love, or commitment. What I think we have here is one group of people who are doing an act in order to define their relationship with God, and we have one person who is giving out of her relationship with God, which is a different thing. And so when I think about her, I have to ask myself, what does it look like to trust in God's love? What does it look like to believe that God forgives and then forgives again and again and again and again? What does it mean to experience the love of God? What does it mean to experience closeness with God and then live out that experience in the way that one lives day in and day out? If the widow is any indicator, what it looks like to experience God and then to live out of that experience looks like generosity. I think it also looks like acceptance and kindness and inclusion and humility and forgiveness and a lot of other things. It is so important that we have the right God. It is so important that we don't have the God of fear, that we don't have the God who judges and demands, that we don't have the God who chooses one over another, not even if the one that is chosen supposedly is us. I think it is so important that we don't have the God who excludes, but that we have the God who is love. The God who gives love to everybody, even to widows who only have a left on and aren't going to make much of a dent in buying that ultrasound. I think it's important that we have a God who gives love unconditionally, agape, and who draws forth love and generosity. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for that widow. I'm not sure that I measure up to that, but the whole point of the story is I don't have to because you love me anyway. You love each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what wild, crazy theologies and ideologies we chase down, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter how many times we make them, you're there and you love us. And if we can tap into that love, if we can experience that love, if we can live out of that love, we know, Lord, that we become different people.
people who love, who give, who forgive, who are kind, who show compassion and empathy, and all of the rest. Lord, our world needs more of that. We need fewer people throwing bucket loads of cash into the offering and more people just giving what they can from the heart as a response of love. Help us to be those people. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.